Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Williams. I'm the president of the Claremont Institute, and I have the, also the honor of being the publisher of the Claremont Review of Books. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening for a discussion of nationalism and sovereignty. Uh, the occasion for that discussion is Yoram Hazoni's new book, The Virtue of Nationalism. Uh, I know Matt and I, at least, have talked publicly about um, nationalism is a very freighted topic these days. Uh, I, I think Matt and I have always taken the perspective um, that in America, nationalism is a particular thing and maybe somewhat different than European nationalism. It's a nationalism we think rooted in the Declaration of Independence and so less rooted in the blood and soil, old world notions of nationalism. I think Yorm, uh, Yorm's book covers a lot more ground than that and he, he may even disagree with that a bit uh, and agree with it a bit. So we thought this was a wonderful occasion for a discussion about this topic. So let me just introduce our panelists, and then we'll get into our speakers. Uh, Yoram will lead us off, Colin, and then Matt will have the final word, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So Yoram Mazzoni is president of the Herzl Institute, and his books include our topic today, The Virtue of Nationalism, as well as The Jewish State, The Struggle for Israel's Soul. Uh, Dr. Hazoni has written for The Wall Street Journal, National Affairs, and National Review, among other publications. Uh, Colin Duick, to his left, is professor in the Schlar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University, and the author of The Obama Doctrine, American Grand Strategy, Hardline, the Republican Party and US Foreign Policy since World War II, <coughs> and Reluctant Crusaders, Power, Culture, and Change in American Grand Strategy. Uh, Dr. Duick is a prolific writer for both scholarly and journals and the public prints, uh, and most importantly from my perspective, uh, he's a frequent contributor to the Claremont Review of Books. <laughs> Uh, I say that as much out of a sense of gratitude as self-promotion, I promise you. Um, and then finally, we'll hear from Matt Spaulding. Uh, Matt's Associate Vice President and Dean of Educational Programs here at the Kirby Center of Hillstone College. He's also the author of the excellent book, We Still Hold These Truths, Rediscovering Our Principles, Reclaiming Our Future, and he's the Executive Editor of the Heritage Guide to the Constitution. Uh, he's also written two fine books on George Washington. I, I encourage you to check them out. And then also, most importantly, for my purposes, again, he's a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute. So uh, please join me in welcoming our scholars, and let's get into it. Thanks. You are. Okay, well, first of all, thank you uh, for hosting me in this, uh, this lovely building, uh, Ryan and Matt. And, uh, and there's so, so, so many great people who've uh, worked on, on organizing this um, and uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, well, let, let's, let's begin with blood and soil. Uh, I don't think that I've heard the expression blood and soil used so frequently anywhere in the world as among American intellectuals. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of one of these buzz phrases. I'm not, I'm not sure how many people know where it comes from. But uh, basically, blood and soil is a, uh, is a German version of a very general phenomenon. The, the general phenomenon is that we look around the world, not just the last few hundred years, but going all the way back into antiquity. And uh, we see the word nation being used. And we see things that look to us like nations. But these nations have different traditions and different, different views of things. And some of them claim that uh, you know. Some of them claim that uh, uh, that blood and soil is is the key. And some of them claim that uh, that uh, the, the Declaration of Independence is key. And others claim that uh, that uh, uh, that the Torah or, or 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 the Bible is key. And and you can just keep going. What's wonderful about nations? I mean, you can say there's all sorts of bad things about them. What's wonderful about them is their intrinsic diversity. The uh, they are all different experiments, different ways in which um, human societies try out being human. Some of them are terrible and some of them are good. Some of them have things to teach the whole world and some of them may be less so. Um, the reason that the subject is uh, so interesting today, obviously, is because there's been a, you know, just in the last few years, in America, in the UK, Italy, Eastern Europe, Israel, India, and uh, Japan, and, and beyond, 
um, the free world has seen a sharp turn in the direction of uh, thinking about reconstructing uh, or returning to a construction of uh, the political order, which is based on nations, which is based specifically on the independence of nations, which means that nations, each one of them, would, should be allowed to express its own constitutional and religious and legal traditions without being interfered with from the outside. Now, very, very, very few of these nations historically have spoken in terms of blood and soil, as, as I say. Each one has their own approach. But that doesn't mean that we, as uh, members of the, the Anglo-American tradition or the Jewish tradition or any other tradition, that we necessarily would look at at each of these nationalisms and love them. We might not. We might look at some of them and say, wow, you know, I think that's appalling. But some of them we would look upon in admiration. And the, uh, the argument uh, that the nationalists are advancing, if I can sort of put it in kind of a, a general view, the argument that nationalists make is that the world is better off and this is a principled argument. It's not, not simply an emotional expression. A principled argument. The world is better off if it's governed in this way, that nations are allowed their independence and their freedom. They're allowed to determine their own course. Now, why is this so important? Well, it wouldn't be so important if it weren't for the fact that for the last generation, this sim seemingly simple intuitive idea, uh, well known in the Anglo-American tradition, going all the way back to the Hebrew Bible, this idea has become anathema. It's become detested. It's become hated, specifically among educated elites. At least for a generation, at least, for, at least since 1989, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, maybe earlier, but at least since then, if you take a look at the major political parties in the United States, in the UK, and across Europe, the major political parties have been united in saying, something different. What have they been saying? They've been saying that actually peace and prosperity will come to the world best and most easily if there is a single set of rules, rule-based international order, as some people like to say. Some people call it liberal internationalism. If there's one set of rules, one set of values, which is going to be determined to apply to the whole world, and somebody usually the American armed forces with token assistance from Europe, somebody is going to impose that. Now, it's astonishing that this idea could go for a generation without there being kind of an explosive debate about it, because it Im implicit in it is uh, a view that used to be called imperialism, going back to Roman times. But you know, the, 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 the medieval church or the, 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 uh, the Islamic caliphate or, or, or the ancient Babylonians or, or, or Assyrians all had this idea. Peace and prosperity will come to the world if we impose order, if we suppress violence, if we eliminate the dissent and create a single order for the world. In the early 90s, there were Americans who said, um, the fight against the Soviet Union is over. We won. Let's go home and let's take care of America because it needs it people like Irving Kristol or Jean Kirkpatrick, but those voices were swept aside. And uh, you know, if it had turned out well, then maybe we would be living happily in a liberal, liberal universal empire, but it didn't turn out well. And in my book, I argue that it couldn't have turned out well because no one actually knows enough to be able to govern the entire world. And when they try, then you get at best, these terrible scenes like we see the Germans trying to govern Greece by remote control, or, or the, the Italians deciding who their finance minister is going to be in some kind of a, a veto from, from Brussels comes and dictates, no, no, that's not an appropriate finance minister. So Italy's not an independent country anymore. In my book, I argue that the, uh, the reason that we should want a, uh, a world of free nations is, well, there are a number of reasons, but the, the, the first, and foremost, first and foremost is, is, is the issue of freedom. The great political theorist, uh, Emmerich de Vattel, uh, from the, 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 the 1700s, 
known today as one of the founders of international law, he advanced the theory that the reason for the balance of power, the reason for the diffusion of power among different center, centers of government in, in Europe at the time or in the world, is in order to preserve freedom. The whole reason that we go through the exercise of diffusing power internationally, he said, is so that no state should have sufficient power in order to be able to dictate the law to all the others. That's the entire goal of international relations as far as Vettel is concerned. We know this argument from domestic politics. That's the reason that the Anglo-American tradition has a, uh, a, 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 a diffusion of power among competing branches of government because we know that if there's only one, then that's going to tend towards tyranny. The same thing internationally. Now, that people can reasonably argue. That doesn't mean the fact that you have diffusion of power among nations, well, it might assure diversity, it might assure competition, it might even assure freedom, but, it doesn't assure, but, but then it would be a national freedom because it doesn't guarantee that every single one of these nations would have the kinds of uh, uh, limited government and individual freedoms that we asso associate with the Anglo-American tradition. And that's absolutely true. It's simply true. When you decide that you're not going to dictate the law to the entire earth, that means, as I said before, that sometimes there are going to be nations that are going, going to do things that you don't like. But notice the following, I think, crucial point. The only place, historically, that we know of where limited government and individual freedoms have been developed is in national states, independent national states, the Netherlands, England, Scotland, Switzerland, the United States, and others. There is no example of an empire in which you gather together the, uh, the will to conquer the whole world and then impose a certain rule on everybody and then miraculously it turns out that what you've imposed is individual liberties and liberated, limited government. Forget about it. Napoleon tried that. Right? Millions of people died. If anybody wants to argue that that was good, I'm willing to take them on. Okay? A, ter a, a terrible, vicious imperialism, but in the name of liberalism, in the name of liberal values. Finally, I think that, it's, um, it, that in, in, ad in addition to this crucial point that, that we, we only know of, um, of democracy and limited government and, and civil liberties flourishing in national states, in addition to that point, I think that you also need to consider today, especially in America, where, where tolerance is going. I mean, surely everyone's noticed that, that America today is a far less tolerant society than any of us can remember from as far back as we can remember. I mean, I'm not saying that there hasn't been progress on certain issues, but today, I mean, who's not afraid to say what they think? You know, I mean, it, it's really terrifying. And I think that we should try to imagine where is this coming from? And I have a proposal in the book I propose that it's coming from the movement of uh, elites especially, but really of the public in the direction of a universalist imperialism. Now, it's complicated because we know the Marxist universalism, right, that, that we call progressives or the left, we know that they want to take over the world. We know that they think there's only one, one truth. We're familiar with that. But what about the, uh, the universalist liberals? They're not Marxists. The, all they talk about is freedom, freedom, freedom. Freedom is the centerpiece. I find those people also, many of my closest friends included, I mean, really people I've known for many, many years. In the last generation, they've turned in the direction of saying, well, we know what truths are appropriate for the whole world. In fact, I can just give you the answers. I can write you a constitution for any country in the world. I don't have any problem with engaging in, in uh, military uh, adventurism. I'm willing to bomb civilian centers in order to eliminate governments that I think are not appropriate. Now, if, if, if we were talking about Nazi Germany, right, then all of us would think you should bomb Nazi Germany. But what if you're not talking about Nazi Germany? What if you're talking about cases that are much more complicated? Some of my friends are too willing to use these kinds of operations in order to impose their view of the way countries should run all over the world. And we've seen all sorts of examples of that. 
I think it hasn't turned out well for America, and I don't think it's turned out well for those countries either. Again, if someone wants to argue with me that Yugoslavia is in good shape today, or Iraq, or Libya, let's go. I don't think it works. Where's the intolerance coming from? I think the intolerance is coming from a state of mind, especially among our intellectuals seeping into our politics, and then out to the public. A state of mind that says, I know the answers for the whole world. Just give me the power and I'll take care of it. And I think that corrupts liberals just as much as it cor corrupts Marxists. In fact, it would corrupt anybody. And what we need is a conservatism, a traditional Anglo-American conservatism or something like it, which is willing to say, I think my way of life is the best, but I'm not willing to go and send troops to impose it on the rest of the world. It, I think it's the best. But no one knows enough to know for sure, and I'm not going to take that responsibility. Thank you. Okay. Call. Thank you. Um, well, it's a terrific book, and uh, I urge you to buy it. Uh, buy it twice. <laughs> it's, um, it is the single best argument that I've seen in many years uh, for the very simple, powerful notion that there really is no alternative to the nation state as the best uh, political unit in which free people can experiment with constitutional forms of self-government. And you might think this is obvious. The very fact that that's controversial is amazing. I mean, it shows you the changes in liberal thought over time, and it's why this is such an important book. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a great read. It's uh, very engaging. I also like the fact that he defended nationalism, not patriotism, because anybody can do that, <laughs> but nationalism specifically. I thought that was a kind of a courageous move. Uh, much of the historical account is persuasive. As Joram points out, nations historically have not come together because of social contract theory for the most part. They've come together because groups and tribes aggregate. That's the, that's the historical reality. He's also right, I think, in a sort of withering account of the international hate campaign against Israel. Um, and he's right that there is a kind of liberal imperialism that has sometimes misled Western countries, especially in the post-Cold War era. Uh, and that's been a bipartisan trend. So um, these are a number of strengths of the book. Uh, but if you had asked me here just to say the ways in which I agreed with him, that would be boring. And, and I'm sure that's why you didn't, that's not why you asked me. So I will, I will raise a few polite questions. And they mostly have to do with the issue of American nationalism, nationalism specifically, which is sort of my primary interest. Um, it is challenging to develop a global theory of nationalism, right? Because there are different kinds of nationalism. It seems to me Venezuelan nationalism is not the same as Russian nationalism, is not the same as American nationalism. Uh, American nationalism in particular is democratic, not authoritarian. And I, my understanding, uh, my, my st study indicates to me that going back to the founding, the um, American experience has been to emphasize American national sovereignty, but at the same time hold out long-term possibilities for the expansion of popular self-government. And this was not just Thomas Jefferson. It was the founders as a whole, Washington, Adams, uh, Hamilton. So this was, this was a broadly held belief. Then you get debates between the founders and throughout American history as to how exactly to do it. And it's true that many prominent Americans and factions and parties over the years have said, we don't need to do it necessarily through military intervention. We can do it by example. That's quite right. Um, and if, after all, the founders didn't have the capacity for the kinds of massive military interventions overseas that Americans have engaged in more recently. Um, so there was a kind of tradition in the 19th century which was consensual and bipartisan, which was we do hope for the spread of Republican forms of government, and we preserve American national sovereignty. Uncontroversial. It seems to me that Woodrow Wilson comes off a little easy in Yoram's account, because I've learned from Claremont that Wilson was something of a revolutionary on domestic affairs. Uh, but I also think he was on foreign affairs. He, he represents the break from the founders on foreign policy. And it's not simply because he, he proposed permanent commitments in Europe and, uh, and in other continents. It's because he really had a kind of project of global governance. It's true he spoke about national self-determination, and he believed in it as a way of dismantling European empires. But after all, he did propose a project in the form of the League of Nations that involved serious 
uh, secession, secession of American sovereignty. Um, U.S. senators understood this, which is exactly why they blocked it. Uh, those were universal binding commitments, and the American public and the Senate wasn't ready to accept it. Uh, now, ever since Wilson, I think American conservatives have sort of wrestled with how to respond to Wilson. I mean, he's the granddaddy of liberal internationalism over the past century. The initial response of conservatives was to say, we reject him, right? By the 50s, leading conservatives like William F. Buckley said, we will continue to uh, preserve American sovereignty. However, we think there are some very <laughs> severe challenges that are going to, the Soviet Union, international communism, are going to require us to play a role in the world that we previously didn't play. We're going to have to make alliances. We're going to have to build up our military. We're going to have to have bases and military intervention overseas. That was Buckley, National Review, mainstream movement conservatism starting in the 50s. Uh, so there's been a debate on the right and internally as well. And as Joram pointed out, beginning in the 90s, uh, there, were, there was a fragmentation and multiple points of view. And uh, you know, intelligent people can disagree on this. What's been so interesting the last few years is that I think all of the previous orthodoxies from the 90s have just blown wide open. We agree on this, right? And it's obvious that there was a kind of neo-Wilsonian project in the post-Cold War era in both parties, whether it was in Iraq, or whether it was the Clinton version, or whether it was the Obama version, that really went off track. It, it, it was seen by a significant chunk of the American population as basically a failure, and, and for good reason. Um, so we, I think we actually agree on that. Um, however, the question is, what would it mean to come home? I mean, I, I absolutely agree we should revise and adjust and discard some of the more unnecessary accretions of the liberal international project over the years. I have no problem, for example, exiting from the Paris Agreement, right? But then when you get to the core alliances and commitments, um, you know, Britain, Japan, our partnership with Israel, do we really want to dismantle this? I, I don't. I mean, I'm interested in hearing the arguments for and against. What I think we have, we have a sort of, we still have a set of commitments and alliances that, in my opinion, are worth having even once we, even once we get rid of that neo-Wilsonian gibberish that sort of has accumulated over the years. Uh, and this brings me back to the nature of American nationalism going back to the founding, which is that if, if American nationalists and American founders believe that all men are created equal, this is going to have a foreign policy implication. It doesn't mean we have to meddle in every single case overseas. Uh, but it does mean, for example, that a U.S. president has the right to go to the United Nations, as the president did last year, and point out particularly egregious violations on the part of a regime like North Korea. Right? Uh, now, what I'd like to know from Yoram, whose book I thought was terrific, is does the president have that right? Um, or does national sovereignty on a global scale insulate even the worst dictatorships from this kind of criticism? You know, is there any distinction between national sovereignty for democracies on the one hand and authoritarian governments of the worst sort on the other? And if not, then how is that consistent with the principles of the American founding and of the kind of nationalism they embraced? Thank you. Um, well, uh, Joram, thank you for being here and, and Colin as well and obviously our friends at the Claremont Institute. So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, this is, I, I like, I like uh, Yoram's book, we've, we've talked before. Um, uh, he's right to focus on the sovereignty question. I agree, uh, the, the, the question of nationhood is, or the nation state is at the core of it. And uh, his work on, on describing the, the, the problems of, of the modern nation state about globalism and cosmopolitanism and post-nationalism and all the other isms involved in that uh, is very good. I'd like to focus on this question about the nature of sovereignty. Uh, some, some, some following up a couple of things you made. Uh, because it seems to me that there's some interesting questions there that it's very important that we get right. Because if we don't get them right, we might uh, push off in the wrong direction. Um, let me make a, a distinction between the kind of the old sovereignty and the new sovereignty. Or the, the old sovereignty, which say the sovereignty of the, the old world, the ancient world, uh, was he who had the force made all the rules, right? Which is why in, in, in most of the world, in most of our history, you lived in a despotism or a tyranny. Um, or you lived in a situation where there was a divine claim to rule you, uh, whether it was from a king or whoever that might be. Um, 
this becomes especially acute when you get to Judaism, but then especially Christianity, which creates a problem for these things, these growing things which are increasingly, or would become the states or the nation state. Because now you've got a conflict between the city of God and the city of man. And how do you resolve this? Well, we know in most of Europe, they can't figure this out, and we end up having a lot of wars and a lot of people kill each other. But this is one of the questions that the Americans, especially at least the practical level, not the theoretical level, but the practical level, figure out how to solve uh, to, a, uh, to a large degree. Um, and they do so precisely because they define a new idea of sovereignty, which in turn is based on a, on a different idea of legitimacy, uh, which we all kind of alluded to here, which we see most famously in the Declaration of Independence, right? which itself is a wonderful discussion of sovereignty. Right? It talks about we are one people, and this people is gonna separate from another people and assume a station according to what? The laws of nature and nature's God. Um, but how do they define themselves as a people? What is it that gives them a claim of legitimacy such that they can declare their independence? Uh, well, it's that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain enabled rights. Um, this in turn gives rise to the idea of consent and the powers of government are legitimate based on the claim of consent. Um, which is to say that in the Declaration of Independence, you get precisely the, the, the mix of what we have oftentimes confused. Uh, it's a discussion of universals, truth said to be self-evident, but also particulars, right? Universals in a particular nation or a particular nation that's dedicated to universals. Um, there's no contradiction here at all. Uh, in the same breath, they talk about civilization and barbarism and why uh, a tyrant is not fit to be the king of a free people. Um, but it's always about a particular people, a particular nation, uh, and this particular place. Which is to say the founders weren't vulgar, vulgar uh, uh, realists on the one hand, uh, but they also weren't utopian idealists either. And they actually spent a lot of time criticizing uh, the utopians. It's about principle and practice. And it's about the balance of the two of them. Or as it says in the Declaration, prudence will dictate. Right? Or as Washington says in his farewell address, our interests guided by justice. The practical is never separated from the universal. And the universal is never understood other than the context of the practical. Um, that's a different way of looking at sovereignty, it seems to me. Um, the founders were, on the one hand, modern. They favored liberty, limited government, religious liberty, which of course is a very modern concept, um, especially if you compare it to the ancient world. Um, but they're in many ways closer to a, a classical understanding of politics. Uh, politics grows out of the family, the household, the village, the city, but it culminates in the city, the regime. Um, of living well according to some purpose, uh, some principle, some organizing principle, as Lincoln said. And for the Americans, that's constitutional self-government. Um, so what is all this, what does that mean? And why do, I, um, why do I bring it up this way? It seems to me that, uh, to jump to current, current discussions, uh, what Trump has done in the Trump administration, the Trump presidency and the Trump campaign is it's um, revealed a lot of things. It's like pulling the curtain back. It's clearly revealed the left is about will to power. <laughs> we can talk about that at great length. But, uh, but it's also revealed a lot about conservatism um, or what we've long thought is conservatism. Um, and conservatives in America have become kind of doctrinal and rigid and stiff and not capable of thinking prudentially the way the founders would understand that. So it's good to get back to fundamentals, but thinking that through and trying to define what that conservative should be at, should be, is, is, is very important. 
Um, I would argue that the, the, the initial model, which was kind of trying to fuse a libertarianism and conservatism and traditionalism, uh, never really worked. Right? You, you can't actually fuse things. It's, it's, it's a temporary detente. Um, the question is, are there any underlying principles underneath that? Um, and I think part of that is because conservatism has never been completely comfortable with America. Uh, on the one hand, libertarianism is always about individuals. Uh, they're very interested in utility and, and efficiency more than they are with justice. Um, but traditionalists, on the other hand, are always very uncomfortable with rights. Uh, and rights are always universals. And as soon as you bring up the question of rights, it's the French Revolution and the end of the world. Um, and so they spend a lot, a, lot, a lot of their time thinking about other things and trying to find other traditions. Um, and they used to usually point to traditions outside of America. And so they talk about Burke, great length, as Russell Kirk famously did. Um, searching for order as if we don't have one. So I think we need a deeper, better fusionism. Um, and I think it's actually right here before us. Uh, I think the great success of the American founding, uh, which is neither a kind of, it's not blood and soil, depending on how we want to use those terms. Uh, it's not universal liberalism. Um, it's an idea of rights, individual rights, but they're grounded in nature. Um, it's this tradition, but it's guided by justice. That combination of things, I think, is what conservatives ought to be conserving and trying to think a lot about. And I guess I would be concerned that we sometimes um, in different camps of the isms of conservatism, decide that the other um, uh, is, is unacceptable. Uh, and as a result, we don't really have a deeper and more uh, stronger notion of what it is we ought to be conserving. And uh, I think that's the most important thing to ultimately understand. So with that. We can have some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Um, first, I, I just want to provide some opportunity for intra-panel discussion. Uh, I, I did want to insert one thing that I, a, a point of injustice on my part from the beginning. I just wanted to thank uh, Matt Spaulding and the Kirby Center for, for hosting here tonight at this wonderful venue and for co-sponsoring with Claremont. Uh, we're, we're, we're in your debt. This is a great event. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think, Yoram, um, I want to give you a chance to respond to both Colin and, and Matt and maybe particularly Colin's uh, discussion of what, exa what exactly, in, in a world reinfused with the virtues of nationalism, what role would an empire li of liberty have? In other words, what the Trump at the UN sort of thing, or for that matter, Reagan at the UN, uh, what, what role does that have in world affairs? And then to take up Matt's point, um, what do you make of his um, argument, which I, I largely subscribe to, if not wholly, the sort of transformation of nationalism that occurred at the American founding, which um, was dealing both with the transformation of the question of uh, national allegiance and universal allegiance brought on by the rise of Christianity and also at the same time providing a nice sort of amalgam of liberalism but also uh, with a, a due regard to local time, place, circumstances and a notion of national conceptions of defense and justice. Well, I'll, I'll start with the... Uh, sure. With, uh, with Matt. Um, I, I don't... I, I very much admire the um, America, Americans, and American traditions. Um, and yet at the same time, I, I'm very uncomfortable, and this is probably what you're alluding to, uncomfortable with, the, uh, with establishing the American founding as, as if it were um, a unique and unprecedented uh, experience. Every country has the, you know, every country thinks it's unique. And every country has a right 
to think it's unique because it is. And, and people who you know, spend their time thinking about the uniqueness of their own country, they probably know more about it than anybody looking from the outside. So everybody has the right to do it. And, and it's, health, it's, it's healthy, and in many ways it's good. I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is the association with, of the, the principles of the American founding, um, most of which are, I think are wonderful. The, the association of the principles of the American founding with universal reason, okay, which I'm not saying you did, but many people do. That is, they claim that what happened at the American founding or with the De Declaration of Independence and then sometimes also with the Constitution is a kind of creation ex nihilo, um, which, is, which is very, it's very Lockean. It's very much Locke, it's very much Rousseau to think that you could just sit and think and by sitting and thinking, you could just come up with the answers that are right for the whole world. I don't think anything like that happened. I mean, not even remotely like that. So let's take an American founder who uh, is not Burke, he's not from the UK, but he agrees with me on this point, I think, John Adams. Adams wrote a three volume uh, work defending the American Constitution, but the purpose of the work, if you read it, is to uh, first and foremost to show that the English Constitution is the best Constitution that was ever discovered by human beings. And that what's good about the American Constitution is that it's in all the important parts, Adams argues, it is the English Constitution. In other words, what he's saying, and this is very conservative, he's not denying that there is such a thing as, as universal rights or that you know, reason can somehow approach it, but he's saying that the way that reason approaches it is through trial and error, through many centuries of experience, in fact, a thousand years of experience or more. I think that that's empirically simply true. I think the American founding comes out of that. And if it weren't for uh, the, the English tradition, then we wouldn't have uh, the bicameral legislature, the, the, uh, uh, the, the unitary executive, the separation of powers, the uh, jury trial, uh, the, the, the executive veto, the, um, uh, <laughs> the Almost the entire thing, all right, with, with, with some wonderful exceptions. Uh, America goes forward and says, we don't have nobility and we don't need nobility. I think that's wonderful, a wonderful experiment, not English. America also says, the English common law doesn't allow slavery, we do. Another experiment, one that I find despicable. So America is a brilliant thing. It's a wonderful thing. It might be the best thing that there's been, but the mistake that people make, I think it's a, a very big mistake, is, is, is when you say it's the pro basis of reason rather than the basis of uh, the Ang Anglo-American tradition. I'm sorry, I should, have, I should have mentioned the Dutch. Please, if, if any of you have not read the Dutch Declaration of Independence of 1581, please do so, because you'll be shocked to see how much of the American Declaration was cribbed from there. Um, so I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous for America, even more than for the rest of the world, to think that, uh, that it's the pro pro product of pure reason. And, and it's especially very Roman. It's especially very Stoic. And that, that I, I, I think, is much worse than, than it's usually uh, held to be. Um, Can I say something right there? Yeah, please. Um, but you, but you, you've created a straw man. Uh, which is to say that no one has claimed that America is pure reasoning, you know, jumping from Madison's, you know, forehead, uh, like Zeus or something. It's, it's always been this mix. But what we can't do, which is, I, I fear that what is you're, you're doing, is you want to get rid of reason to the extent that all you have left is tradition. And that doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work for America, but more importantly, it doesn't work for politics. Right, because both examples you've raised, the, the decision to declare independence and then the experiment over slavery, which also ends in, in, in a, a fight, both of those were questions of justice. 
And you've got to be able to figure out how do you answer a question of justice without having something to appeal to. Because otherwise, you don't know whether your tradition is a good tradition or a bad tradition. And so my point is tradition by itself is insufficient to the point of allowing for um, uh, nations to exist and to be recognized and for traditions within your own nation to be going on their way as we wait for a thousand years of empirical evidence when they're patently unjust. That conversation is always going to be the essence of politics. It was, it's not American, that's just human. And uh, I think the United States, to the extent that it, it shows the, this, the long development from the Greek and the Romans up through English constitutionalism uh, to the point where they could actually break with the English constitution. Remember, John Adams also is the one at the, at the First Continental Congress says we must appeal to natural right as the basis for our claim. Right? It's, it, 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 it comes a point where you have to make a claim to justice. And so how do we do that if it's merely tradition? Recognizing that, yes, that opens up the question that some people are going to misuse that claim. But my point is it's worse to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Okay, well, I, I think I'm not going to re respond in order to, well, okay, a, a little tiny. <laughs> no, just one sentence. I, I think it's unfair to the English tradition to think that common lawyers like Koch or Selden or Hale didn't know what an appeal to justice was and that Americans sort of just came. Uh, that's, a, that's absolutely not my claim. Okay. I, I'm, but I'm saying uh, you can't read justice out of politics the way, the way you've kind of done by appealing over, so overwhelmingly to tradition because you, you, I, you want to get rid of Locke. You just desperately want to get rid of Locke and so much of Locke I don't like, but you just want to expunge him so much that as a result, um, you, you miss the whole American tradition. Uh, and, and, and that becomes problematic in the same way to, 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 to use, to put it on someone else's shoulders. Um, look, I think Russell Kirk is an extremely influential thinker. I, I, I knew him, I like him, he's, you know, uh, he's very important, but he writes a whole book on conservatism and America is essentially not there except for John Adams and, and whom? John C. Calhoun. Can we make no distinctions here? There's a problem when you, when you try to, to merely stay with tradition. Okay, I, I, I'm glad you put that in, Kirk. I'm not defending, I'm not gonna defend Calhoun. I'm not gonna defend, I'm not gonna defend any of those slavers. You know, you, but, you, but the you, distinction, no, you gotta make you, the, you, that, if, we, if you don't make that distinction, that's the kinds of problems you get into. And I don't wanna see you get into that problem because you made such a great argument attacking the bad nationals, the bad international globalists. Look, just like you said, I so much wanna get rid of Locke, You've got my number, <laughs> all right? I mean, boy, does he make me mad, all right? But I think, I think the mirror image from, from, from your, your side might be um, that y you so much want to hold on to that that you're not, you're not willing to give uh, the, common law tr the common law tradition and this, this, this vast earlier tradition it's due in terms of what it discovered and the way it used the law in order to try to reach justice, because that was explicitly its aim. Yeah. So, so I, 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 I will I grant think, that. All right. So, will you grant the opposite? Yes. Well, so I, I, so, you, I, so I just, you'll keep locking the tradition? No, I'll grant that. I'm furiously <laughs> trying to get rid of him. <laughs> um, you, want, you want to talk about? Uh, well, did, I don't know, Colin, do you mind if we let your? Uh, Commentary stand. I think it might come up in okay. questions. We should give some chance. Yeah. Steve Hayward, please. Yeah, the microphone's coming around. If you're called on, please stand and wait for the microphone. <laughs> Steve, come on. <laughs> I'm in heated agreement with your basic, basic thesis, but I do think someone should play devil's advocate on one point that you didn't bring up yet tonight. And that is that uh, you're quite right to describe liberal internationalism uh, as representing itself as idealism, and we're gonna do all these great good things for you. But I wonder, at least in the European case and beyond, it's really Hobbesianism 
It's really based on a fear of violent death. I mean, I think we missed the historical context that after two cataclysmic civil uh, uh, global wars, Europe suffers politically from post-traumatic stress disorder that the Cold War obscured for a long time. And so Europeans are taught to feel uh, ashamed of having pride in their nations. I mean, that really is explicitly taught to Europeans, is my experience. So the challenge for you is this. If you can get them to, uh, to uh, be reinvigorated, to have some pride in their nations and their nationalism, how do you reassure them that you know, what happened in Yugoslavia is not going to spread around the rest of the continent? How, are we gonna, how is Europe going to avoid falling back into what we saw in the first half of the 20th century? Okay, look, I, I'm, I don't feel that I'm in a position to offer assurances. <laughs> um, human beings are bad, and they do bad things. And, and, and I, I don't think any, any theory that we're going to come, come up with is just going to simply solve that. Having said that, um, I, I think you're absolutely right that there, I, I like the post-traumatic stress description of, uh, 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 of the West after World War II. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily even just Europe. It may even be uh, America somewhat. Um, I think you're exact, uh, exactly right that the, uh, the, the rush to embrace, when I was, when I was a kid, I, I remember hearing John Lennon's Imagine and thinking, wow, what an awful, awful, awful song. <laughs> and, and, and I remember, no, as a kid, think, thinking, you know, thank, thank God it's only some pop singer. And then, you know, later it turns out to be the political theory of, of the major political parties throughout the West. And um, look, your psychological interpretation is correct, but that doesn't, that, that's not a justification for, for a, 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 a terrible piece of a just awful Kantian political theory which has now been just sort of circulating uh, and doing tremendous harm. Um, what I would like to say about, about the First and Second World Wars, which is, is not, it's not straightforward or simple. I say it at greater length in, in the book and, and, and I'm willing to discuss it. I think after World War I, most obser observers blamed World War I not on nationalism, but on imperialism. On the, uh, you may have even caught some of this in, uh, uh, in college, although they don't teach it very much anymore, that the, the, the English and French in the 30 years before that had made this massive grab to try to take over the globe to see who was going to get to dominate the globe, and the Germans said, well, we don't want to be left out of this. How do we get in uh, by destroying France and taking over uh, part Eastern Europe? And um, so that was the old version. It didn't have anything to do with nationalism. It was all about imperialism. With regard to World War II, I think the case is, is even stronger or even more, 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 more obvious. Hitler is no nationalist except if you take his word for it. If you want to learn political theory from Hitler, then, then you can reach all sorts of strange conclusions. But Hitler is an imperialist. Hitler was against the nation state. He says this explicitly in Mein Kampf. First of all, his, his, his goal is that Germany should be mistress of the globe and lord of the earth. That's no nationalism. I, I've never met a nationalist who has anything remotely like that kind of aspiration. And as far as the nation state, he writes explicitly that, that the nation state is, is a corrupt idea, like a, a weak and sickened product of, of, uh, of uh, English and French minds. And the whole goal of, 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 of his, his new biological Darwinian theory is for Germany to, to, to sweep away the nation states, which have create a division of power, a, a dispersion of power, and to concentrate it in the master race. And I, I, people, if you can't see that that's, that that's a fundamentally different political theory, then I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to reassure you. But if you ask me, what should we be teaching European kids and American kids? First of all, we should be teaching them what I, I take to be the, the, the old and good biblical lesson, which is that God of heaven and earth wanted Moses to give the law to the Israelites, and he gave borders and told them that they're not allowed to cross those borders. The God of Israel is the first God, as far as we know in the history of the world, who gives borders to his own people and tells them, you get punished if you cross them. 
Now, that's not just you know, some, some nice historical piece of political theory that they happen to never ever teach in political theory programs as far as I know in America. It's actually an essential thing. Early modern political thought did catch that. Selden knew it, Grotius knew it. They, when they were trying to decide how international law was going to set borders, they were using the Bible as an example. They understood that justice is based first, first and foremost in setting borders. Now you can ask me, why did those people then go, why did those countries then go out and uh, abuse Asians and Africans and, and set up world empires? Well, I'll just tell you, they did it wrong. What should we be teaching? We should be teaching, first of all, the importance of boundaries for democracy and for international justice. And we should be teaching that empire is wrong. Right? Now, does that mean, as Colin, Colin asks, and I think this is a, the right question to be asking, does that mean that you, you, you can never interfere? I think that that would be absurd. Does that mean that you don't have a right to stand up and, and, and accuse others of, of violating what you take to be universal principles? How could, how could you not have a right to say that? How could you not have a right to, to, uh, to, to, to speak the truth and to call it out when you see it? A after all, uh, aren't all those other countries going to accuse America and... and, and, and so how do you make the distinction, though? Right, what, what, what I've suggested is, is the Americans kind of had a way of thinking that through, which is you have to relate a principle, which is true simply, to a practice, which is a particular circumstance. Prudence, the virtue. Right? which is a conservative virtue. Um, but, so, but how do you make the distinction? No, as I, to, as to uh, in a circuit, well, how, how would you answer? No, I, I, completely, I completely agree with that. There's no, there's no way to think without, without going to principle and then from principle So, so you need principle. a universal. Wait, wait, hold, hold on a second. Of course you, no, not a universal, a general. Right? Now we're, ex no, a general no, no, is something that is no, true. No, no, no. You can I'm call so, that a universal no, or not. No, 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 don't, don't. Just, just give, me, give me a second. I, I promise not to take very long, but this is important. Descartes believes in universals. Hume or Newton believes in, in generalizations which are abstracted from experience. Right? That's not the same thing as, as a rational universal that you figured it out and you now declare it to be true for all places and all times. The, the Anglo-American tradition is not rationalist, it's empiricist. And what I'm arguing for, and, I, and I'm sorry, Burke said it best. I, I, I apologize that, that he happens to be English, but so was Locke. <laughs> the goal is from experience to learn generalizations, which we believe, we hold to be true, but, we, but to have the humility to understand that we, we may not be absolutely right. Right? I mean, that is in, in uh, 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 Newton's attack on Descartes, is exactly that, is the abstractions are, are general and we can hold them, but we hold them only until we see that, that, that experience limits, our, uh, 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 limits the, applica uh, the validity or the applicability of the claim. And what, what I find troubling about some Americans Again, I'm not talking about you, but I, find, I do hear it among Amer Americans, is that like the French, they don't have, sometimes they cross the line from this is the best generaliz generalization that people have come up with to this is a universal and it's simply true. If it's a universal and it's simply true, you're now putting yourself in a place that sounds an awful lot like those old theological empires that you were trying to get away from. We don't know things that are simply true. We know things that are, this is so, the so, best. So let me ask you this question. Is there anything we can know to be true? Everything that we know, we know through our traditions, the things that we're is, taught. Is there anything we can know to be true simply without a tradition? There, At all? There, look, it, now you're asking, asking are, are we equally you're, human? You're, you're asking a scientific question, which I don't. No, I, 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 I'm asking a practical, common sense question. Well, Lincoln put it right an abstract truth applicable to all men at all times, right? All men, what? An abstract truth applicable to all men at all times. That all men are created equal. Is that, that's. Do you, do do you, you think, think that's a general or a universal let me, truth? Let me, let, me, let me ask you a question to that question. I, I, will, I promise to answer this, but I would like to ask I think you. people are frustrated with us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I. Do you really think that? all men are created equal, 
is a proposition that can, is inarguable, that reasonable people can't disagree with? Is that, is, is, I mean, is that the point? Yeah, I think it's self-evident, yeah. Reasonable people can't disagree that all men are created equal? Uh, well, they can disagree, but some of them would be wrong. <laughs> okay, so look, so we, we've definitely come to, right, to, no, to a problem. So, so. so, so let, let me speak for, for, for a moment for, for a, a great English political theorist and com common lawyer, John Selden. He is the, the, uh, the principal author of the Petition of Right, which is, you could say, is the first draft of America's Bill of Rights. And uh, he's a great thinker, and he writes exactly about this point. And he says, when, when thinkers like, when thinkers come and, and want to say um, that there are things that are simply known to reason, what example is there of anything, he asks, of, of any, <coughs> any conclusion of reason that any philosopher at any stage in history has come up with that there haven't been other philosophers who are adamantly opposed to? And the correct answer is none. There is no such thing as a philosophical declaration that major, philo that major philosophers have not disagreed with. Every single one they disagree with. So if over thousands of years we can't find anything that philosophers can't all simply agree with, then pushing a beautiful, a beautiful sentiment like all men are created equal, which is, which is in a way, it's a, it's a distillation of, a certain, of, of, of the biblical mm -hmm. idea that all, all men are created in, in sure. God's image. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. It's useful in many contexts. It's important. It, I don't want to take anything away from it except for one thing, which is pushing it to the point that you're going to insist that you know this to be true, and therefore everybody else should know that it's true, and they're just in error if they're not. That, that's just, it, it, that's a, I was hoping that, that, that we conservatives have got, had gotten past that. That's a dangerous place, in my opinion, to be. It's dangerous only if it's untempered by prudence, I think. But I should agree, disagree, sorry. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. Right in the back. <clears throat> Thank you. You say that we should learn from our experiences and our traditions, but when we're distinguishing between all of the different traditions, how do we know that the tradition that we have in our Anglo-American tradition is the best one? And if the answer is because it leads to human flourishing and we've observed that, how do we know what human flourishing is? Thank you. Me? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, see Aristotle. No, go ahead. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this is going to end up. This particular point is going to end up simply going in going in circles, because th the same dispute, no matter what level you take it to, the same dispute recurs. There are some people who think that you know what justice is or what the absolute standards by which to judge. There's some 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 thinkers, rationalists who think that somehow you can just figure it out and in such a way that, that all properly thinking people should come to the same conclusion. And then there are empiricists who think that that's simply absurd. And it's only our, our traditions, what, are, what our parents taught us, the principles that we have, and then us attempting to reason the different principles against one another and apply them in experience, which gives us an answer to questions like, what, what is justice? All right, so some people try to, uh, to say, um, you know, I, I don't want to put that much weight on, on, on human reason, so I'm going to put it on God. All right, and then they'll say, so God revealed it, so that solves the problem for me. But it doesn't really solve the problem, because, it, it, because if, 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 if you study Hebrew scripture and you look at the way that the laws are given, then you see that actually God gives laws in iterations, and there is a process of discovery as God discovers what human beings are like. And over that process, the, the, uh, the, the determination of what laws are good and proper emerges. Okay, so, so this is an, I, I don't wanna say this is irresolvable, 
But this is one of those things that philosophers simply can't agree about, is some of them think that they are smart enough to figure out for all times and places certain crucial truths that they can then use to judge everything else. And then there are others of us, the empiricists, who think you're kidding yourself. You got that from your parents, from your schools, from your traditions, and, and, uh, um, and also from e examination empirically of history. That's where you got that theory of what is just and what is best. How will you know? You try it out and you see what... So I, I'll just have a very quick footnote, which is you've only given two alternatives, and again, it's a straw man, which is that it's not merely, it's not empiricism or pragmatism versus rationalism. Uh, there's another alternative, which I think is the dominant Western way of thinking philosophically, which is the kind of Greek Aristotelian Thomistic way of thinking about uh, human nature and about justice and about uh, all of these questions that is actually also extremely practical. And it's about relating principles in politics in particular things. That's a very, that's another way of thinking. I think that's, that's a third alternative as opposed to the two you've laid out, which is precisely what I think is the one that, among other things, informs the Western tradition, which uh, culminates or at least leads to uh, American thought. This will be our final question. Sir, you know. Apologies to everyone else. Hi, Vladimir Tikarov. I'd like to hear your opinion kind of about really the future of nationalism, but in the following context. Nationalism comes from nation. And I think there's a few empirical facts today about all, whatever we want to call them, rich nations, developed nations, you know, they're all in demographic collapse. The reproduction rates are, you know, the birth rates are half of the reproduction rates. Within the demographic collapse, there is a replacement of the dominant ethnic or religious group. The share of the minority in the newborn is much higher than the share of the general populations. And in many societies, these groups have totally different cultural affinity and loyalty to political institutions, to ideology, to many of those things. Labor participation in all our nations is extremely low, and it's absolutely actually not comparable with historical labor participation because when people had low labor participation in the 50s, meant that this means that a lot of mostly women stayed home raising three, four children. Today, most of the low labor participation is, you know, single, unemployed, unemployable, elderly population, which is more and more dependent on the government. And the last thing is we all have democracies which with all the good things we can tell about them from a career perspective of the politicians are extremely short term. You know, job security means winning the next election. So in the context of those facts, how do you see the future of nationalism as a political expression of the future of our national destiny with those very important facts? that are trends that are very hard to change in the next 20, 30, 50 years. Thank you. Look, I, I think this is a terrific question. Um, and, and really, we should spend an evening on, on these issues. But l l l l l uh, l let me try to focus on, on one specific point, which is I think that the issues you're raising are, are I think the issues that you're raising are, 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 are best understood as asking the following question. What do nations need to do in order to actually survive? And you're hinting, uh, but I'll say explicitly, you don't have to agree, that what nations have to do to actually survive in history is not the same thing as the worldview that comes out of, uh, uh, of uh, a certain set of abstract principles about liberalism and democracy. That's one of the, the points that I try to make in, 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 in the book, and I, I think much more weight needs to be put onto it. How can a political theory, how can a, a way of understanding the politics of one nation or of many nations, how can it possibly be the best political theory or the right political theory if in experience we see that what happens is that it leads to demographic collapse and that the countries are then not, nations are then not sustainable. All right, now I don't, I don't associate the American founding with 
John Locke and liberalism exclusively, although I, I admit that Locke was there and he's important in some documents, but no, no, but I, I actually- <laughs> the, the, the evil seed is there. Uh, evil, that's saying, <laughs> that's saying a bit uh, much. I, I, I would say that it's, that it's, uh, that it's immensely uh, foolish to take an abstraction from the market, which is good at describing economic functions and turn it into a theory of all politics. It's just a terrible theory. So I, I, as long as it's limited to, to economics and other areas where empirically it's useful, then I'm fine with it. But this gentleman has just pointed to, uh, I don't know, doesn't this worry you? 40% uh, of children are born outside of marriage in the United States right now. Or, 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 and, and, and rising. In Europe, it, it, it's, it's even worse. The population, the fertility in the United States was uh, just, just announced that it dropped to 1.76 and, and will probably continue to drop just as it does across Europe. So I live in Israel. Israel's one of the only democratic countries where the, uh, where, where, where the birth rate is going up. And I'm not saying that we've solved all the problems in the world. We sure haven't. But Please let's focus on this. Americans and many other and many European countries would be really happy if their f fertility rate were going up instead of down. Now, I'm not saying that I know exactly how to solve this problem, but I do have a pretty good idea of where it comes from. If you try to turn political theory into uh, uh, to reduce it to a theory of individuals taking on obligations strictly on the basis of consent and reaching the decision as to what to consent to strictly on the basis of their reason. If you, if you teach that to generation after generation for, for 100 years and you say there's no Bible in the schools and there's no counterweight to it, there's no source for, for any kind of obligation other than your own consent, well, guess what? Two people who want to stay married will not be able to stay married because they haven't been given the tools to do it. Locke doesn't give people the tools to stay married if they want to be married. And he doesn't give them the tools to understand why they should have children. If, 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 it just becomes too scary to have children. I know, I have, I, I have children and they're scared. <laughs> you can say, and they're having post-traumatic stress syndrome from growing up with Yoram. <laughs> that may also be part of it. I, I, I think this gentleman, I don't know if you agree, but I, I, I think he's touching on the key yeah. factor. Are we going to simply say we, we have the universal truth for all time, or are we willing empirically to correct it? Saying we're willing to empirically correct it does not in any way take away from the greatness of the American founding or the American nation. But it's realistic and it's important if you want America to have a future. So, so the, the key to our demographic destiny is having a self-identity, right? That's what Israel has and that's why I think it's... No, it's, 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 no. It's, the key to, to the demographic destiny is to go back to studying the Bible, which is the source for many of the traditions which have dissipated in America because after World War II, Right, up until World War no, II. I'll, 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 I'll grant you that point. The point I was, I was going to make a slightly different well, I mean, point. But, but from, 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 from a generally speaking, I would, I would, I'll, I'll grant the point you made. But my point, and the reason I bring this up, is that part of getting American figured out as a nation is for Americans to rediscover what it means, which is why these are crucially important conversations to have. And I think we can't merely shunt that aside and turn America into merely rationalism. Um, we want them to love their country, and loving their country means it. what's the principle, what's the thing, what's the end, what's the good for which it stands. That's why I think this is important to think through. I and, and I th think that to, to merely shunt to decide is Lockeanism, I think, misses what America is. And I, I think that, at least here, has to be the heart of what conservatism is about. Well, I, I, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't say that America was Lockeanism. I know some people do. I don't think it's historically true. 
And I think that if it were historically true, Americans should be willing to make some adjustments because it's not all of who they are. And I think on that, we, we really do agree that John Locke is not all of who America is. And learning about what America is, I think it has to involve Locke, but it also has to involve the Bible and also has to involve the common law. By the time you do that, you might be able to get to an answer to, to this gentleman's question about how, how Americans could, could have a future. Uh, well, I just briefly, it struck, it struck me that even for, obviously if we had a fourth person up here who was a liberal global governance <laughs> advocate, you would see that we agree on fundamentals, the three of us right. do. Um, <laughs> You know, it's the, the thing that keeps coming up is for most American nationalists, it's important to understand in what way it's American. In other words, it's not just the nationalism, it's the Americanism of it, and that's where we keep getting this debate. But, I mean, just to sort of stick up for your arm on this point, it's not as if the main problem the last 25 years has been a, uh, a, an excessive American sense of nationhood. I mean, I, America is an idea, but it's also a place. And if politicians from either parties forget that when they're pursuing trade policies, foreign policies, immigration policies, if they forget that they are there to represent the interests of U.S. citizens, the voters will remind them. And that's where, that's where I think we're at now, actually. So, I mean, in a way, this is Yoram's point, and Daniel Webster said it. The last, you know, the last logic of kings is also our last logic. We must survive, you know? Well, I encourage everyone to read Yoram's book. Uh, visit claremont.org and hillsdale.edu for more lectures on these things and writings. And thank you all for coming, and thank you, Dennis.